Okay, cool. Cool. So uh, I'm going to be talking about um, how DBAs and developers do their dance together, and some sort of a little bit, a few tips of making it work together. So um, I have my background is sort of a lot of d data architecture stuff. Uh, I used to I'm but in a sort of a development role, not in the DBA role. Anyway, I'll talk about good and bad DBAs, some secret sources, and tips from the pros and your truly, and I talk a little bit about code versus data. So how to spot, spot a backend developer? You can read the slides, but it's really about, yeah, not being, uh, not being stupid and uh, not like, read this particular article, I that this article is so bad and you've got 9,000 claps. Uh, how to spot a bad DBA? The bread and butter is index drawings modeling, and obviously, if they do the same thing, they're really bad. Um, and how to actually spot a good dev DBA? What's the secret sauce? Actually, well, you've got to do the hard work, right? It's no easy thing, but w what you want to make sure is that uh, they don't suck. That's the number one criteria. <laughs> so if they're bad, then they, they can't be good at the same time. Uh, but if you really want to know the secret sauce, it's actually called Ivar. It's a Serbian secret sauce or Bulgarian and whatever. So you can get it. If you know where it is in Singapore, let me know. I'd really like to buy it. I couldn't find it here. Um, OK, so dancing is not a solo activity. It means that there's, it takes two to tango. These two guys are kind of doing their thing, but it's not, they're not really quite in sync. So it's all about the DBA's understanding the developers and vice versa. So what I did is I googled how to be a dance, dance partner and what comes up on the top is this company in Florida and you can read basically what it's all about. Um, I'm going to use them as my guide to, to, to the pros. So number one tip is to say the determine following leader. Obviously it's the developer that's the leader. So the developer, they have, because they're actually leading, they, they are leading the change. And the DBA is there to sort of to execute the change, but they definitely have to lead. Number two, keep the count. So the DBA is actually keeping the count because they are release cycle. So the tempo is actually set by the DBA. Otherwise, it's just uh, the DBA is good. like if the DBA is forced to keep the is forced to, to change the tempo, everything is going to screw up. Number three, beware of other of other dancers. So if you have okay, there's two people on the floor, but there's actually other people as well. Doing the changes in the microservices world, it's a lot easier than it used to be back in the old days, but it's still, you can still screw up other people. And the final thing is you stay relaxed and responsive, meaning that you, know, you have to make sure you work with each other and you don't, don't be a prick, basically. Um, so those are the tips from the pros. I'm going to share a few other tips from myself, um, which, is, which are all mind, mind the gap related, or mind the gaps. So there are all different kind of gaps that you want to make sure that you want to avoid or deal with. So the first gap is going to be communication. So you can really, it's very hard to over communicate and it's very easy to under communicate. So what you know and what the other guy, so don't assume, the, the more assume, the, the, more, uh, the more chances that you're going to, someone's going to screw something up. The second one is knowledge. So obviously, there's the DBAs should know the good ones. They should know a lot about indexing joins, how data works and stuff. And the other way around is the developers should know a lot about their applications, what they're supposed to build, and they're supposed to share that knowledge and assume that the other person doesn't know that knowledge. The third one is in big companies, you have multiple teams, cultures, and conventions are very important. If you work across different cultures, if you have a lot of people who are. You know, a lot of things are not said or said in a different way. The fourth one, time zones. Anyone working in big companies, timing and time zones and just the sort of the whole disconnect in, in timing can be actually quite a pain, but it can be also quite good if you know how to manage, how to deal with it. So just plan for it. Okay, quickly, uh, two golden rules of software is don't screw up the experience, don't screw up the data, because if you screw up the data, you will probably screw up the experience as well. And how that actually, why, does that, why is that important? Because the code versus data debate is which one is actually uh, likely to outlive the other. In my experience, especially now, the data is 
will actually outlive code. And this is something, as, as a developer, you should keep in mind, is that it's not that the actual data itself is more important. DBA as a dev, which, which is likely to outlive the other? <laughs> uh, in my opinion, it's actually developers. I mean, the DBAs, well, the bad DBAs will go away. That's really sad for a lot of them, but the bad ones will be automated. The good ones will still need to be there. And finally, remember, it's not a competition. You know, it can, be, it can appear silly and stupid, and as long as you work with other people together, it's all good, and have fun, like this guy's having a lot of fun. And that's it. That's my okay. All right, everybody, uh, pressed next. Okay, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Aries Yousefian. I recently came to Singapore. I work for a company called Stratascale. Uh, currently, I'm uh, working with uh, a major bank here, kind of uh, enabling uh, private cloud, going through a digital transformation. My title would be customer success engineer. So, uh, you know, I find myself working with a lot of customers. Right now, I'm pretty much focused on this one major bank here. So, uh, I'm going to basically talk about infrastructure as code, and in particular, Terraform with the AWS provider. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with uh, Terraform, but if you're not, IEC is basically you taking your application infrastructure and codifying it so you don't have to point and click install where it could be prone to human error. You can uh, reuse it very easily and uh, you know, it's very powerful. Now, you know, we're DevOps pros. We use this uh, probably day to day to make our lives easier. And the public clouds are pretty much set up right now to consume it automatically. Uh, which, is, which is great. And not just Terraform, I mean, you see Puppet, Chef, Ansible, SaltStack, uh, all very great tools. Uh, the unfortunate thing is enterprises really don't have that capability. Uh, not all of them anyways, because often there's regulatory hurdles, uh, there might be data sovereignty issues that prevent them from kind of taking advantage of, uh, you know, IEC tools. Uh, and that's where, that's where kind of uh, my company's product, Stratascale Symphony, can, uh, can be of uh, assistance, I guess. So basically, we allow you to kind of have an AWS compatible region on-prem. So you can go ahead and use uh, the, the Terraform mm -hmm. AWS provider in particular against it. And I'll go through a bit of a, a simple application of this, and we'll, we'll go through that. But if you're curious about this platform, you take four or more servers, uh, install a, you know, a Linux-based uh, OS on there. You use KVM hypervisor under the hood clusterize everything, and there you got your API, AWS API is kind of ready for you to consume. So the reason why, um, you know, we, I love Terraform personally, and, and obviously AWS, is AWS out of all of the clouds is by far the biggest. They're the first to the, the race, and uh, Terraform is actually a newer tool, but it seems like the community is growing rapidly. It's open source. Anybody can write a provider for it, and by far the AWS provider is like the most popular. So basically we're I know I'm trying to paint a portrait of you can now have like a hybrid DevOps infrastructure with, uh, you know, if you have a Terraform based pipeline, you can kind of push that against on-prem as well as uh, in the cloud. So this gives you a lot more agility, it gives you a lot less rework, you don't have to kind of fight with uh, proprietary APIs that, you know, um, your, your existing on-prem strategy might be giving you. And also, I mean, you know, there's also some TCO stuff here too, you know, often you can look at AWS and their platform services especially, they're very expensive. Um, so, okay, this, this slide got really <laughs> messed up here. It's okay, don't worry. We have a GitHub, uh, Strato, -AWS, um, Strato AWS examples. If you just Google uh, Strato Aries, you'll, you'll find my GitHub where I fork the repo and you can find the, the main repo where uh, we go through these. Now, here's the Terraform primer. I mean, essentially, here is a simple application. Uh, basically, you know, you have your VPCs, you got some subnets, you have some instances. The provider is very simple in AWS. You got your secret and your access, and then you specify a region, and that's it. You know, the rest is magic. So the fir first, the building blocks on AWS are pretty simple. You know, you define your uh, VPC and your subnets, and obviously uh, you have your CIDR block for your VPC and your subnets individually. Uh, in, in Symfony world, we can back these with VXLAN and VLAN-based networks, and you, you can control these yourselves. Uh, we define our compute uh, instances, and in this case, I believe we're just, it's very simple. We're deploy, uh, deploying just a server, creating an elastic IP and attaching it to it. And if you're not, you know, in Terraform, you can have uh, variables, arrays, lists. Uh, you can dynamically provision, grow, shrink your infrastructure very simply by applying and reapplying. And obviously a platform service. In this case, it's just a load balancer, but this could also be a managed database, uh, Kubernetes cluster, um, uh, object storage. You know, like there's so many, so many different <coughs> services out there. Uh, AWS is quite a few. Obviously, we can't compete with the sheer number, but... Uh, 
At the end of the day, this is what the application would look like. You have a very simple example, again, a compute, network, load balancer, all defined individually. These could be their own individual files, or you could put them into one, and the provider which represents that. Now, when you flip over to Stratascale, uh, I just want you to note the difference here. You have to specify the endpoints. Otherwise, it's the same uh, architecture. You have your access into a secret token that you can generate. Uh, you can back that by an Active Directory type infrastructure as well. And the region is really irrelevant because now it's your own region. And aside from just that provider, everything else is the same. So you can go ahead and, again, by just modifying that provider, you can uh, deploy the same exact infrastructure on-prem. And uh, I mean, I, I came from an OpenStack world. It was, there's an OpenStack provider for that, and you'd have to essentially write two pieces of code to describe that. Now, I, I don't have time to get into all of these, but really, you can have all of these platform services running on-prem. Uh, we manage the images, but Kubernetes, ELB, EFS, serverless, uh, it's all there. So that brings us to the end. Uh, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. If you have questions, you can always ask. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is David Varvel. I'm the director of Pivotal Labs here in Singapore. Um, this is called Rethinking Agile and DevOps in 2018. It was originally designed to be a 30-minute talk that was going to be an overview of various trends in the industry and things that we're seeing in 2018. So I'm trying to, going to try to crunch it down to an ignite here. Um, a big theme here is automation. And I think that's the big meta trend that we've been seeing in all of DevOps for as long as DevOps has been around. Um, if you go back to 1998, you know, this, that, that's actually pretty much me back in the 90s, you know, screwing in computers. And now we have create a computer at the push of a button. And what we've seen over time is turning these hardware problems into software problems. And because they're software problems, they're automatable. So if you look at where we were last year, a lot of the conversation was around containers. We'd, we'd virtualized and automated a lot of the stack all the way going up to the, the container level. And we'd actually gotten even above the standard OS level. This year, we've got tools like Knative, and we're um, putting things on top of Kubernetes and container management to provide function as a service capability. And operators are now dealing with, with function as a service platforms and trying to provide that to their dev teams. So now ops teams are, are going all the way up really to the application layer. They're, they're starting to play in a space that used to be the domain of application teams. And if you look at what developer teams are doing these days, they're, they're moving even further up the abstraction st stack. And they're, they're moving to, to functions. And um, you know, they're, they're chasing each other. But there's, there's in, an increasing amount of overlap between what operators are dealing with and what developers are dealing with. This creates a lot of new questions for developers. You know, how do I build things? How do I test things? Uh, you know, these low-code environments are coming up. Um, my using containers, you know, functions as a service, how are we writing things? And the ops teams also have an increasing number of questions of how do I, how do I handle all of these containers that are emerging, all of these different functionalities, how do I patch things, how do I monitor, you know, functions as a service, how do I do application monitoring and support in that kind of environment? Another thing we're seeing is there's more complexity with continuous integration and continuous deployment. We're seeing more and more things get automated and put into these CI pipelines and um, these pipeline-oriented CI tools. We're also seeing an explosion of complexity with microservices. Microservices have really taken off, which means we have a ton of new databases, new data sources. Um, that we have thousands of, you know, running thousands of different applications that are these microservices. And what this is doing is this is forcing dev teams and ops teams to get closer together, even more close together than they were before. The, you know, there's, there's no way to really have them work separately for the most part. However, there's, <coughs> oh, sorry, we're st we are seeing an increasing number of teams that are called things like toolsmiths. These are ops teams that are not dealing with so much server and network infrastructure, but building ops tools, building CI pipelines, building security scanners, and building things that the dev teams can use. We're also seeing operators that are even further away from the dev teams. They're holding up the whole world. You have In Comcast, they have four operators supporting thousands of applications running a single platform. We're also seeing a lot more data coming off of these applications. Um, analytics tools are getting more sophisticated. And these are metrics that are often good for both developers and operators. You know, people who are trying to keep these apps up and running are, uh, are using them, and, and so are our app teams. This is creating a lot of reorganization. 
you know, people, we're, we're continually running around saying, okay, who needs to be part of this integrated team? What, how do we structure this inside our company? One role that's really taking prominence these days is the SRE. This is a role created at Google way back before, but it's not really taking off. And it's kind of 50% coder, 50% operator, and they're trying to bridge the gap by creating a lot of automation. Now, it's important to say, I don't know the answer to a lot of these challenges, but we're figuring it out as an industry, and we're all um, having conferences like this to try and share ideas of how can we restructure these teams and how can we make ourselves even more product productive. Um, this is another one of my favorite quotes when thinking about this stuff. We are seeing companies like Google really lead the way. They created the SRE role, I think, back in 2004, but it's just now starting to take off in a lot of the industry. And so we're looking for a lot of thought leaders and borrowing ideas from them and then distributing them out. So thank you very much. Um, I love talking about this stuff. Happy to talk about it anytime you want. Okay, yeah, so um, I can save a lot of time, but not saying it's just my Twitter here, you'll follow me, you know the drill. Research into DevOps bottlenecks. As David uh, mentioned, we don't know anything, so we learn. We asked smart people about research, about their bottlenecks. It turns out that we are talking about DevOps bottleneck, we are talking actually about delivery bottlenecks. You all know the circle, and actually whoever struggles to deliver, those are the bottlenecks. We asked different kind of companies, huge like uh, military companies, financial companies, all the way to the tiny startups, and you can see the answers are all over the board. Six months, one month, two weeks, one day, and then we're like, okay, probably those who release less frequently is not satisfied. What do you think? Everybody are satisfied. People who release once in two years, tell me that they're great with that, and people who release uh, many times a minute, they are okay with it. With them, so how do we know what is good? How do we know what to measure, and how do we know uh, the answers? And there are a lot of. So, for example, if the quality doesn't suffer, or if we automated everything, but most prominently, two answers why people are not releasing faster. First, there should be enough food on the table. It means. Uh, our customers won't accept too frequent of releases. And the other is quality. So let's talk about the first one. The first one, why not to update? We heard answers like, uh, well, our customers have to do acceptance testings and they, want to do, they don't want to do it too, too frequently. Or, well, th there are not enough meat on the table. So th the answer to that is very long, uh, but we wrote a book about it. So uh, it, it's a book, uh, not mentioned today at all, called Liquid Software, written by two co-founders of JFrog and myself. We talk about how we build the trust so the customers can accept our changes more frequently. But what about the quality? What about the manual QA? Don't we have to do like more rigid QA? And something that we did mention today, the State of DevOps report um, of this year, they actually proven that there is, not only there is no reverse correlation between the release uh, velocity and quality, but there is a direct correlation. The faster you release, the better your quality. And this is the answer how. When you start to release faster, in the beginning your quality suffers. But then you put more effort into automating quality and you, get, and you actually get better quality than you started with. So back to bottlenecks, those are the three. Education, automation, and trust. Education, people need to understand why they are doing that. And this is like the, the most important outcome of, um, of this discussion about education. People need to know that they can do it. People need to believe that they can do it in their organization, and people actually need to care about doing it. Another big thing is job security. Oh, all the manual QA people, all the old school sys admins, they are going home. Fake news, they are not going home. They're evolving to do other stuff. The sys admins become SRE engineers, the QA people become QA people, but doing more interesting job. Tools have to be Immutable, scriptable, universal, because this is how we automate, this is how we improve. Those uh, super DevOps teams, that six people that hold the universe, this is what they do. 
they provide support for a stack that they know and believe it's right. But it's not mandatory. They're not dictate. Ah, oh, it's not working. I had like an entire slide, an entire 15 seconds for you to enjoy the animation. Well, basically, she falls back and then there is a guy that comes with the cup cupcakes and everybody run to it and she falls. <laughs> oh, that's such a good slide. All right, so um, trust is about uh, commits that fail. It's about the software that doesn't go out. It's about how we ensure that this quality bottleneck that we spoke about is good enough. So first of all, improvements in automatic testing. We do better and better. But also, we learn how to use our users as our beta testers, but in a reasonable way. And the answer is kind of re-releases. OK, now that was a mediocre attempt to provide 45 minutes talk in five minutes. Good news, if you go to show notes, there is a video of the full talk. So you can enjoy it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, hi. So yeah, I'm Joseph and I'm a software engineer and DevOps evangelist at Government Digital Services of GovTech Singapore. So we're basically like a development arm and training arm for the rest of government. So today I'm here to talk to you about the blueprint, a blueprint for objectively measuring this culture that we know as DevOps. So you know the drill, DevOps is a culture, it's not a role. But culture tends to be subjective, it's qualitative. But companies on the other hand have agencies, they're objective, they're quantitative. So in my role as a like training other agencies, this question comes to me, how do I convince companies to take on DevOps as a culture? And I found my answer to this in this thing called the definition of done, which is borrowed from Agile Scrum, which answers the question of how done is done. Because done to a developer may be something different from being done to the end user, because it's not done until it's in production, right? So what does it look like? It looks like a checklist of what, where, and who. So what form does the product take? Where can it be found? And who is responsible for it? So, this definition of done, the, what it enables us to do is it lets us identify firstly people, which is the stakeholders of the project, and secondly, it helps us to identify how do these stakeholders access these environments. So my argument today is that this is the ground zero for building your DevOps capabilities. And why this is important is because it lets us create well-defined states and environments. So in other words, it's so in other words, like the environment should be, for example, it should be the, it, the behavior should be the same across all environments. For example, it should be isolated, it should be accessible by the right people. So to understand why this is so, it, it brings us back to the primary ideology which started this whole DevOps thing, which is maximizing value and minimizing waste, which Eric Ries wrote about in The Lean Startup in 2011. So he brought, to it, uh, from it, he brought us to it from a product perspective, and he basically outlined a cycle of building, measuring, and learning. So we built our products as, as experiments, we bake in metrics so that we can measure user behavior, and finally we learn from it to build even better products. But you know, he's from, a, he's from the product side, management side, and what he didn't know was that the technical people actually figured it out about 10 years ago in the Agile Manifesto. And it came in the form of customer collaboration, which is one of four key principles of the Agile Manifesto. And basically it says, get the product into the hands of the customer as soon as possible, because that's when you can really find out if your stuff works. And that resulted in and the requirement to enable frequent deployments. So like, you know, traditionally with a waterfall model, you like try to avoid deployments, it's scary. I mean, developers love their weekends. Yep. So back to the topic on DevOps and why this is important. So to me, if there's one question that can effectively measure DevOps, it will be how quickly can working code go from a developer's machine into production? So I mean, ideally it would be every push, but you know that doesn't always work out and it might not always be necessary. So it's useful to think about the product in the form of a pipeline of roles and environments. So for example, developers write code and the product exists in the form of code, followed by the QE environment, which they write end-to-end -end tests. They will test whether the system, is, the system works, followed by the POs, which do the UAT, like has the code been written according to specification. So all of this brings us back to the point on well-defined states and environments, because having such isolated environments actually allows us some benefits. So the first one is fostering of ownership. So like, with every role and every environment it passes, the product actually adds on value. So it fosters ownership because everyone knows that it, they are part of this product development cycle and everyone knows their roles in order, for the, in order for value to be added to the product in the next stage. So secondly, it reduces interference. So let's say if you wanted to cut something, I'm sure you wouldn't want a jackknife like this. So this illustrates the single responsibility principle. And when your environments and stakeholders are clearly separated, you'll, be able, you'll actually be able to 
work on the environment without worrying about affecting the other environments. So this creates a very efficient pipeline for development to happen. So let's say a developer writes code and code breaks quite often, but the QE doesn't have to worry about that. And if the CEO is announcing some other thing, it doesn't matter either because like, the environments are clearly separated. So next and last is actually it facilitates multi-level feedback. So feedback doesn't always have to come from the end user. It can come from the quality engineer, it can come from the product owner, and basically everyone in between. So like, once you have your stakeholders and environments clearly separated out, you'll see that things can happen, feedback can occur between all the different environments and not just from the end user. So for example, the QE may feedback immediately to the developer that your code isn't working in the grander scheme of things in the system. So all of this is done with the objective of being lean both in development as well as production, which enables feedback and, and enables us to ask further questions, which helps us to optimize how we foster DevOps as a culture, such as those questions. So we do all of this through this thing that we know and love, which is automation and DevOps and this squiggly little line, which says like, yeah, you should come to DevOps days. No, I'm just kidding. It's the definition of done. So my call to action to you today is to go back, take a look at the definition of done. Have you, have you clearly identified your stakeholders and your environments? So yeah, thank you for listening. I, if you didn't get anything, yeah, you can check out my Medium post over there. I will be posting up the transcript over there. So yeah, thanks for listening.